wasn't just kidding. I'm actually going to deal with a different portion of Scripture this morning than uh, than I intended. We had been going through the book of James, an excellent, an excellent. Uh, opportunity for us to study the practical implications of our of our faith and deeds. So I actually had a good sermon, I think, I prepared this morning, but, uh, but I'm going to do something different and hope that God will bless it. The text this morning will be from Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you now verses 12 through 17. This will serve as our text this morning. So as those who have been chosen of God, compassion, kindness, and humility, gentleness, and Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is the word of God. God. Let's ask God to bless the study of the word. Father, we do pray that you would bless this time of study in the course of our worship. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds as we seek to understand your word. We pray that whatever is said or done would bring honor and glory to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So, beginning there with verse 12 of chapter 3 of Colossians, if you have your Bible with you, uh, please open it to that place. So, as those who have been chosen of God... He's speaking now of those who we would call the elect of God, electos. Those that God, before the foundation, before the creation of the world, that God called to be his children. Uh, That's the very essence of what it means to be chosen of God. It's the basis for our understanding of the love of God, of the grace of God. Apart from understanding the doctrine of election, in my humble opinion, it's very difficult to grasp the import and the importance of the grace of redemption. It's very difficult, apart from understanding that we were chosen by God before we existed. It's very difficult for us to walk in our understanding of the faith with humility. Because somewhere in the recesses of our our fallen nature, we tend to continue to think that there is some good in us, something in us that commends us to follow and to trust in Jesus Christ. We recommend, or we, we recognize rather, when we understand that the reason we are Christians, those of us who have trusted in Christ, is because God has chosen us, has wooed us, drawn us. I was warned of that drawn us <clears throat> we should have put the speaker a little bit further because I know I'm going to be walking around so get used to that but <laughs> Travis told me not to do that those, those who understand that they have been chosen by God are much more likely to recognize what grace is and how grace ought to be ultimately we are redeemed by God of God so it's not of us we understand then that, that this idea of cooperating, deciding for God at our point of conversion is simply not what happens. We may, we may in our trust in Christ, but what truly happens the Holy Spirit quickening us, effectually calling us to Jesus Christ, and then giving us the gift of faith and repentance and trust in Christ in and of ourselves. God has to give that to us. It's a gift of God. And so as we think of the idea of election, we also look at the forward to the purpose of election. Now, the purpose of election is God's glory. God glorifies himself in the fact that he has chosen us, in spite of ourselves, to be his children. Uh, We were born in an uh, enmity, hostility toward God. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Nevertheless, God has chosen us to be his children. He has reconciled us to himself. But first, he must be reconciled to us because he is the offended party. 
That means that he has provided a sacrifice to compensate, to atone for, to cover our sinfulness in Jesus Christ's work on the cross. We understand then uh, that our faith in Christ is a consequence of God gifting us the ability, I'll use that word reservedly, to trust in Christ alone as our self, our Savior and Redeemer. And so he's called us to be holy. There's a lot of different understandings of, of exactly, exactly what that means, to be, to be holy. Uh, there certainly is the idea that we are to be sanctified, uh, that we are to reflect our calling, our election in Christ, in our behavior and our attitudes, our words, our purpose, our values, uh, what we think is important in life, our priorities in life. Indeed, uh, there is a very important application there of this consecration unto God in which the fact that we are set apart in Christ allows us by God the Holy Spirit to reflect that sex, uh, set apartness, that consecration in Christ. That's what sanctification actually means. But again, we had definitive sanctification, which we're set apart, consecrated unto God, and then we have practical and progressive sanctification in which we progressively live out our faith. And it can be seen by other folks. Ought to be, must be seen by other folks looking at us. And so our election then is that we would be holy and that we would recognize that we are beloved in Christ. We, we don't do anything to earn the love of Christ. God simply loves us because He has chosen to do so for His glory. We recognize uh, that our love has been demonstrated for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sin. We recognize uh, that God loves us because He tells us so in His Word. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This love of God for His elect is a sure thing. It is irrevocable. It will never be thwarted or taken back. Who God loves will remain in the family of God. Who God loves will never fall away ultimately from the faith. Those that God loves will persevere in the faith until one day they will be with Christ in heaven. They will see God face to face in heaven. So as to those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, listen to this. This is what we're to do. I've just described for the most part, what we understand as the indicative sense of Scripture. We talked last week about that. That was really not the first time we, we talked about that. That was really a review, a reiteration. The indicative of God is what God does for us, to us, through us. Our election is the indicative of God. Our redemption is the indicative of God. God does all of that. He does that for us. Now, we understand that because of what God does for to us and with us, that we are to live a certain way. We are to relate to one another a certain way. And it's described here for us in, again, keeping with that paradigm, that hermeneutic of indicative and imperative, uh, with the imperative here, which is what God commands of us because He has saved us, what does He want us to do to look like in our lives? Well, it's quite a challenge. He wants us to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Now that's a very challenging imperative. It truly is. The problem is that even if we are chosen by God, redeemed by God, we don't immediately reflect that. In fact, some of us will never consistently reflect that redemption in our behavior or attitudes during our lifetime. Hopefully, though, that will be reflected somewhat in degrees progressively throughout our lives. The problem, though, is that we don't often know what we're really dealing with. What we're dealing with is a fallen nature. Before we are saved, uh, we have this fallen nature in which we're not just spiritually sick, but we're actually spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1, you are dead in trespasses and sin. 
folks who aren't converted can't understand that until God illumines their heart so they can really begin to grasp the hopelessness and helplessness of the circumstance. But even those who have been saved, as I said earlier, continue to have some little part of their, of their heart, mind, and soul that they think still is good. And that they are able to, to get a handle on, on their redemption and their salvation uh, because they choose to do so. But where we see the rub is in the relationships we have with other people and those that we're closest to in life, in our families, our husbands, our wives, our, our siblings, our children, our, our cousins, our, our aunts and uncles, these, these folks that some we see a lot of, some not so much. But in those relationships, we begin to understand uh, that there is that part of us that really is not very loving, not very compassionate, not very forgiving, uh, not gentle, not kind, not especially humble. And then in the relationship we have in church, this is especially a challenge to learn to do what the apostle is commanding us to do, to have compassion and humility, kindness and humility, gentleness and humility, patience and humility, bearing with one another with humility, forgiving each other out of humility, to do this in the context of church is really difficult, especially over the long term. I remember a movie I saw that illustrates the problem we have. I am not recommending the movie to you. I know uh, better of doing that. Uh, but it's Young Frankenstein. Some of you have seen this movie. And there's no question that, though there's some things in there that, that uh, are challenging, uh, but there are some very funny things in it as well. And one of the things that I actually got, got a, a very good understanding of what we're dealing with in terms of uh, this particular instance when Frankenstein, the Baron Frankenstein, Frankenstein as he preferred to be called, went to the castle he inherited uh, from, I forget, I think it was his grandfather, I'm not sure if it was his grandfather or dad, and so he goes to this castle and Igor greets him. Now Frankenstein is a surgeon of some renown, so he goes to the castle, Igor, you know, the, the helper who is also a humpback, uh, and crippled pretty much, comes to him and he, he's got this, this walk and this hump just like this, okay? And he meets Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein, you know, greets him friendly and he says, you know, I can help you with that hump. And Igor says, well, what hump? That's exactly the way we tend to be in terms of our sinfulness. Someone tells us, you know, I, I've got some answers for you here. I can help you with this. And you say, well, I don't, I'm, I'm okay. I don't need help with that. You see, we've got this hump. And even when we get to the point where we recognize that we, we, we're a humpback, then it changes to the other side. If those of you who saw the movie, that's what happens. Every time you see Igor, his hump's on a different side of the back. And so we, we, somebody finally gets us to admit that we've got this hump on this left-hand side of our back. And then we say, okay, I'll just switch it. That's the challenge we have in church. We are folks that have these deformities of spirit that are very difficult to come to terms with in ourselves but almost impossible to deal with in other people, especially when you so plainly can see the problem the other person has and perhaps recommend a solution, but that person can't see that problem. And so this is the challenge. As we exercise a genuine forgiveness, why do we forgive? Not because we're good people, not because we're nice people, but because we have been forgiven by God. And to the extent we recognize how extent, extensive rather, and the degree and depth of that forgiveness is in Christ Jesus, we will quite naturally be more willing, perhaps not ever completely willing, but more willing to forgive other people. 
because we recognize that we have been forgiven ourselves of so, so very much. And so the result of this application, living in this, this forgiveness for one another, is love. This is agape love. You know the word. It is a different idea of love than the world has. It, it, it's not necessarily affection. There may be affection with it, but that's really not what it is. It's a, it's a volitional love. When we, we actually make a decision out of our regenerate nature to love somebody who may be indeed unlovable. And we do this not because we insist on reciprocity. We, in fact, may not have this return to us. We do this because we recognize that this is what it means to be a Christian and to live with our brothers and sisters in Christ in unity. It is what God demands of us, that we're able to actively love other people, and they receive a benefit that may not be returned to us. Now, that is not the world's idea of love at all. And when folks talk about love in the world today, they're talking about, at the very most, in terms of any Greek terms we find in the New Testament, phileo. That, that, that's a love that involves friendship. It's a good love. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's not at all uh, what Paul had in mind here in this particular text of Scripture. He's telling us to choose to forgive people to love them in spite of themselves, even if we don't really want to. And then he says, this is the perfect bond of unity. You get it, right? I mean, if you really are choosing to love people in spite of themselves in a very active and practical and obvious and overt and a conspicuous way, then that itself becomes a bond of unity between us. It enables us to get along with one another in a way that perhaps we can't naturally get along with people that come from different backgrounds as us, that have a different um, educational background, that a different level or degree of affluence, folks that may have very real differences with us. We are able to get along with those folks in, in the family of God that is the church, the body of Christ, uh, because we have chosen to love folks with agape love verb, agapao. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. What we're doing right now is we're actually submitting to the authority of the word of God and we're asking that God would use his word, that God the Holy Spirit would take his word and apply it in a very real way to our hearts, minds, and wills. And we recognize that even in submitting to the Word of God preached and taught, there is a correction there. There is an encouragement there, and there is indeed an admonishment there, and sometimes a rebuke there that could be very painful. But it's always in our best interest. And we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What does that mean? Are they all synonyms? No, they're not all synonyms. The only thing that makes them similar to one another is the fact that they are all ways to glorify Christ, lift Christ up, to glorify God in the course of our worship. The music, the singing within a church is very, very important. And in doing that, our souls, in a way that we really can't understand completely because it's invisible to us until it works itself out in us, we recognize that as we sing psalms and hymns, as we did today in the course of worship, and spiritual songs, uh, that we are being bonded together because we have been brought into union with Jesus Christ. And when we sing these songs, because we believe the same things about Jesus Christ, and we understand the same things about our faith in Jesus Christ, even recognizing that our recognition, our understanding, and our knowledge of Christ is not going to be equal in any of us to one another. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. If we, have a, if we are to have a healthy church, folks have got to 
learn that what they are doing within the context, first of all, everybody in the church should do things, but those who are doing things should understand uh, that the things that you're doing, while they're necessary to the health of the body, you are not necessarily necessary to the health of the body. This preacher is not necessary to the health of this body of Christ. That is very important for us to recognize. And so that enables us to use the gifts that God has given us, the consecrated abilities that we are, are allowing to be used by the church. It, it allows us to do those kinds of things without necessarily expecting that others will appreciate what we just did for them. Everyone wants to be appreciated. Everyone should be appreciated. And in a healthy church, you'll have expressions of appreciation all the time to one another. Especially looking out to the folks who really are doing things behind the scenes that most people are not even aware of. I can't imagine what, what Travis and I would be doing just in a, the simple thing of putting a bulletin together without that lady right there, Allison Elliott. She does that without fail for almost three years. It's weird, Allison. <laughs> I am so thankful for it. I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that we have gifted musicians that use their music and their gifts to the glory of God. To me, that enhances our worship way beyond what I've experienced or did experience back there. You know where. I'm so thankful for Travis Sims. That he can lead singing the way he does. He grew up in a very weird church. <laughs> church of Christ. They sing everything Acapulco. <laughs> and if you're going to sing, you better be able to carry a tune because the instrumentation is not going to cover up your mistakes. And so this guy can do it, man. He's good. And he's got a strong voice. I can't do that. I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful for your teaching in Sunday school. And I would encourage you guys that are not coming to Sunday school, you need to come to Sunday school. It's good. It's good stuff. I could go on and on. We've got our deacons who do a lot of things that perhaps you don't recognize. Uh, the, the session is doing, are doing things that, that uh, you may not always be aware of. We have folks who are very faithful and supporting the church that of course you wouldn't be aware of necessarily. These are all very important things. But speaking for myself, I want to be appreciated, but I don't need your appreciation. I don't do what I do because I need that appreciation. I do what I do because God has called me to do what I do. Notwithstanding the fact that it may not be done all that well. Nevertheless, that's my motivation. What's your motivation for being here today, for participating in worship, for doing the things that you do for us? I think in virtually every instance, just because I know as a pastor, I know the congregation, I think the motives are the right motives. I see it. Let's do more of that stuff. More of it to make us healthier. In spite of providential circumstances that are quite difficult. This is difficult. You're hot. You know, you guys are spread out in a very weird way. I tell you, as a preacher trying to get a crick in my neck. And I can't even walk like I want to usually walk because if I do, I'll, I'll get in trouble. What's the deal? <laughs> but nevertheless, we have worshipped Christ today. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Our Father and God, we're so thankful for your blessings and grace. Thank you for each one here. Uh, we thank you for this room and for Wayland Baptist University that has been so hospitable to us. Uh, we recognize that that, too, is a gift from you. But we do appreciate what they have done. Uh, we pray for each one here. We pray, Father, that the gospel uh, would ring true uh, to each one here, that they, they, each of us would recognize that we do have these humps and that we are sinners and, and that that is indeed why Christ died for us. That we would give up any hope of trying to save ourselves and we would cast ourselves with abandon upon the cross of Jesus Christ and ask Him to do with us what He will. I pray that for each one here today, young, 
and old. I pray, Father, uh, for blessing for each one here, young and old. In Jesus' name, amen.